After Confederate forces fired on Fort Sumter in 1861, militia companies began to form across the entire state of Texas. Initially, the Confederate government wanted Texas militia to stay in Texas in order to provide defense in that frontier part of the Confederacy. But 10 companies of Texas militia marched to Richmond without authorization. Those companies formed what became the nucleus of the 1st Texas Infantry Regiment. By October of 1861, the regiment was joined with several others to become the Texas Brigade. The Texas Brigade really began to make a name for itself under a Kentuckian who had adopted Texas, John Bell Hood. Carrying 1853 Enfield rifles, the brigade fought savagely on the peninsula and began to operate as one of the shock troop brigades for the Army of Northern Virginia. By the time they arrived here in Sharpsburg, the 1st Texas Infantry had just 226 men in their ranks. They were under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Philip Work. The Texas Brigade, now under the command of William Wofford, who in turn reported to John Bell Hood, who commanded the division. Hood's division arrived here near Sharpsburg on the 15th of September. And a lot of people don't realize that there was actually a fair bit of fighting that took place here uh, between Union and Confederate forces on the 16th. And the Texas Brigade was involved in some of that fighting. The PA Bucktails, uh, who actually carried Sharp's breech-loading rifles, uh, actually uh, came from the north and engaged in a pretty hot skirmish with the 1st Texas and others. Eventually, the Bucktails were driven back through the woods. Their colonel was killed in the action on the 16th. And the Texas boys uh, received permission to fall back to the rear, back to the Dunker Church, which you can't see, but is kind of along that next ridge line behind me there. They hadn't eaten for a while, and so they asked General Jackson for permission to get some rations. Around, around 9 p.m. on the night of the 16th, it began to rain, and it rained for a number of hours into uh, the night. The men waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they finally got their rations at about 4 o'clock in the morning. Having fought on the night of the 16th, having endured the rain, and now staying up half the night waiting for rations, they finally got them. They started cooking their rations. They'd put them on ramrods and stick them in the fire. And just as they sat down to start to eat, the opening artillery bombardment began that signaled Hooker's attack on the morning of September 17th. It was around 7 a.m. when the men of the 1st Texas were told back here somewhere in these woods around the Dunker Church that they needed to line up and form for battle. They were going to be part of the counterattack because by this time, Hooker's advance had pushed through the cornfield in the distance and driven the Confederates off of this ridge behind me, and they were starting to fall back, and so reinforcements were desperately needed. And Hood's division, who were still upset about the fact that they hadn't gotten to eat, uh, were none too happy about having to go into battle, but they began to form up. And you have to understand that while this is going on, there's already been fighting for at least an hour back there. There's this tremendous artillery duel going on. Stephen Dill Lee has something like 20 guns on this hill here. There are at least 15 guns under Pelham up on Nicodemus Heights in that direction. Beyond the Antietam Creek in that direction, there are... Uh, probably 20 long range, like 20 pounder parrots, things like that, that are firing from the Union position down onto the Confederates. And then there are dozens of guns uh, in multiple batteries under Hooker that are firing 
from the north. And so there's artillery and small arms fire and noise and smoke. And you've got men who haven't slept and haven't eaten. It's a recipe for disaster on both sides. And that's kind of what ends up happening. So the men form up uh, and uh, I'll head over a little further across to give you a sense of exactly where they were and what happened next. The men came out of the woods. This is the Hagerstown Turnpike and uh, they actually lined up. The Hampton Legion would have been on the left right along this road here. And then from left to right, uh, the Texas Brigade lined up with the 1st Texas being in the center of the five regiments. So they would have been a little further over this way. The commander of the 1st Texas said they didn't even have to give a command to attack because as soon as everybody was into position, they began to charge at the enemy and drive them back. On the receiving end of that charge were elements of what we know today as the Iron Brigade, including the 6th Wisconsin. The 6th Wisconsin had already been in combat for a while at this point. They were running low on ammunition. They were exhausted. And Rufus Dawes of the 6th Wisconsin said that when the Texas Brigade charged into them, it was like a scythe cutting through uh, at harvest time. Uh, you can just picture that in your mind. Uh, for a commander to say that about what happened to his own men, how devastating that attack must have been. And the men in blue were driven back through the cornfield. The men of the 2nd and 6th Wisconsin fell back. They honestly, they, they ran back uh, as quickly as they could through the cornfield. They had exhausted their ammunition. They had been torn to shreds. And the furious attack by the 1st Texas and the other members of their brigade uh, was more than they could stand. We're now on the north end of the cornfield. There's a fence here, and this fence is pretty important. This is the, the D.R. Miller farm. It was Miller's cornfield here. The 1st Texas, as they pushed through uh, the men of the Iron Brigade, and as they drove through the cornfield, obviously, as you can see the corn, it's really difficult to understand what's going on more than a few feet around you. And that's what happened with the 1st Texas. As they charged, they didn't realize that they were significantly out in front of the other members of their brigade. In fact, by the time they got to about 30 yards from this fence in the cornfield, they were about 150 yards ahead of the rest of the brigade. And here, lined up along this fence, were two fresh brigades under George Gordon Meade. The Texas boys got, as I said, about 30 yards away when Meade's brigades unleashed just a crippling volley on the men of Texas. The colors went down. About a dozen men around the colors went down. Within a few more shots, there were very few men left standing. And that's before we even take into account Hooker's artillery that was massed along the ridge behind us there. And so you can just imagine, the men are angry. They haven't eaten. They're winning. They push forward. They feel like they're really doing something incredible. And then just in a moment, their entire line melts away. <laughs> 
when it was all said and done, there was very little left of the first Texas. There was one man fit for duty from Company A, two from Company C, three from Company E. There was no more Company F. Over 80% of the men of the first Texas fell in maybe an hour or so of fighting. It was the single greatest one day loss for any unit in the entire American Civil War.